thank you for being here, Barbara. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I brought the book with me because I, I want to be like super clear. Uh, th this book has um, had more influence on the way I view the world and what's happening in our country than anything I've read at least in the last five years. Um, if you haven't read it, please go buy it. And if, you, if it doesn't live up to it, I'll give you your money back, okay? It's, it's that extraordinary. Let me just start by asking you this. Is the United States still the longest standing democracy in the world? No, no, it's not, uh, which surprises many people. It's actually Switzerland. Um, the U.S. was the, 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 the perfect example of a democracy. We were the first modern democracy. Um, we were this grand experiment on how you can bring popular sovereignty to a large country. And I think most people assumed that we would be that exemplar forever. And that ended uh, at the end of 2020 when the US's democracy was downgraded um, to what we call an anocracy uh, for the first time since 1800. And that meant that we were no longer considered a democracy on par with countries like Switzerland and Canada and, and Denmark. We've since gone up a bit. Our democracy has improved. Um, the fact that we had a peaceful transfer of power was huge, um, but it doesn't put us on par with Switzerland anymore. So who, who decides what's a democracy, what's an anocracy, what's an autocracy, yeah. and how, how do you do it? Like, can you break yeah. it down? So there's, uh, there's tons of different data sets. Um, there's a big center in Sweden that studies uh, and, and, a, and measures democracy around the world. Um, for the last five years, I've served on a task force run by the CIA. It's called the Political Instability Task Force. And um, the job of the task force was to come up with a predictive model to help the US government predict where around the world um, countries uh, were likely to experience political instability and political violence. And um, when we put together the model, we thought of every possible variable that could put a country on the road to civil war. So we thought about things like poverty. We thought about things like income inequality, how ethnically and religiously diverse a country was. Um, we put over 30 different variables into this model, um, and only two came out highly significant. And they were two variables that um, we on the task force did not expect. We were quite surprised by this. Um, the first variable that, that predicted quite highly what countries were, were likely to become unstable and experience violence is something we call anocracy. That's just a fancy term for a partial democracy. These are countries that are neither fully democratic nor fully autocratic. There's something in between. Um, and the second variable was whether the citizens in those partial democracies began to organize themselves politically around identity, whether they began to form political parties around ethnicity, religion, and or race as opposed to ideology. Now, keep in mind, what was so surprising about this is the CIA is not allowed to study the United States. We never looked at the United States. We never talked about the United States. All the countries we were looking at were outside the United States. And those were the two factors that best predicted which countries were likely to experience civil war. And, and so I'm on this task force. We met every year, about four times a year. I'm sitting in conference rooms um, in, in suburban DC. And starting in 2016, 2017, 2018, I'm looking at what's happening here in the United States and I'm realizing that both of these factors are emerging here and they were actually emerging at a surprisingly fast rate. Now you asked, where do we get this measures? The CIA, the measure they use for anocracy comes from this nonprofit organization. It's called the Center for Systemic Peace. It's, it's in suburban Virginia. Um, and every year they go around the world and they assign a number to countries from negative 10. If you're, you don't want to be a negative 10, if you're negative 10, you're the most autocratic country. You're the, that's where North Korea, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain are negative 10. To positive 10, those are the most democratic countries. That's where Denmark and, and Switzerland are. And that's where the United States was for most of its history. Um, so in 2016, the Center for Systemic Peace downgraded the United States' democracy for the first time. Most people don't know this. 
It went from a positive 10 to a positive 8. That was pretty shocking for those of us who study um, uh, democracy and civil war. It was downgraded again in 2019 to um, a plus seven. Um, and there are lots of reasons why they did this. And then by the end of 2020, when we had a sitting president who refused to accept the results of an election and try to, tried to overturn the elections, we were downgraded to a plus five. Now that might not seem important to you, but civil wars all occur in the anocracy zone and the anocracy zone goes from negative five to positive five. And so the United States was suddenly in this middle zone where most of the instability and political violence tends to happen. And in, in the countries that have gone into anocracy and then gone into civil war, you mentioned these, these two factors which stand yeah. out. Can you, can you dive yeah. into that a little bit deeper and elaborate? Like, what, what are the commonalities of the countries where things go wrong? Yeah. So probably the best thing I can do is give an example. Um, many of you were probably alive when um, the former Yugoslavia fell apart and descended in, into civil war. And that's sort of a perfect example of these two factors, these two risk factors. In fact, the CIA had predicted, they had put out a white paper two years before um, uh, the war in Yugoslavia, and that white paper said there's going to be a civil war in Yugoslavia within the next two years. It actually happened a year and a half later, and it's going to be started by the Serbs. So they actually knew who was going to initiate this war. Um, and and what you how, how do they know that? How, like, <laughs> how could they deduce that? So one of the things that happened in Yugoslavia is it went from being, you know, basically part of, of uh, the Soviet Union. It had an authoritarian regime under Tito. And when the Soviet Union collapsed, Yugoslavs were allowed to choose whatever political system that they wanted. And lo like lots of countries, they wanted democracy. And they tried to democratize really quickly. And they held elections. They held their first competitive elections. This was great for the Yugoslav people. It was terrible for people like Slobodan Milosevic. Slobodan Milosevic was a tried and true Communist Party member. He had political power because he'd been a good soldier of the Communist Party. Now, if he wants to keep power, he has to suddenly compete in elections. And he knows that Yugoslavs don't like communists, and he knows that they know that he is a communist. But he's also quite smart and strategic. And so he realized that one of the advantages he had was that he was Serb. And Serbs were the largest ethnic group in the former Yugoslavia. And he very quickly understood that if he could convince Serbs that they had to band together during these uncertain, changing times, that they had to stick with their Serb compatriots and they had to vote for a Serb, that they would vote for him whether they agreed with his politics or not. And Milosevic had created this narrative that he continuously um, broadcast on state TV and state radio that the Croats were organizing. The Croats were, it, and if the Serbs didn't organize, the Croats were going to gain power. And if the Croats gained power, they were going to kick the Serbs out of their jobs and kick them out of the military. And they could potentially start killing them like some of them had done during World War II. And the Serbs were insecure. The Serbs, they didn't know what was happening. Everything was changing quickly. And they banded behind Milosevic, and it created this situation that when he decided that they had to go into Croatia to save the Serbs in Croatia, they backed him. So you just said um, changing quickly. Um, to what extent yeah. does, does speed, does the velocity of the power <laughs> loss or gain affect yeah. the, the risk factors? Yeah. So it's not just whether you're in this middle zone. It's whether your government is, is transitioning either up towards de democracy and therefore you're going into this middle zone on the way to trying to become like Denmark, or you're going the other direction and you're in democratic decline. And the speed matters a lot. If you have a change 
Almost all the civil wars happened in countries where you had a change of six or more points on this scale in a three-year period or a five-year period. The U.S. had a five-point change. So we were, we were right about there, not quite as quickly as, as you would see in the worst cases, but we transitioned surprisingly quickly. And the reason speed matters is, is because it's really a proxy for, for change and uncertainty. If you have a government that's declining really rapidly or democratizing really rapidly, that means the old leaders are, 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 are leaving or they're getting kicked out. New leaders are coming into play. Institutions are weakening or institu new institutions are being put in place. It's really a proxy for a weak and unstable government. And if you're an ambitious politician or if you're an ethnic group that feels it should be in power but wasn't in power, um, this, is the, this is your best chance to grab power. And to what extent does the, um, the, the, the risk rise if the group that is uh, aggrieved um, is, is co-located? Does geography matter here? <laughs> It, so we actually know who, who tends to start wars. That's why the CIA was able to predict that it would be the Serbs. Um, the Serbs had, hmm, let me take a step back. The groups that tend to start civil wars are not the poorest groups in society. They're not the weakest groups in society. They're, they're never the immigrants in society. These are disempowered groups. If they ever try to mobilize, if they could mobilize, um, they, they would probably um, be squashed or they wouldn't have the resources to, to do so. The groups that tend to start civil wars, especially ethnic civil wars, are what we call sons of the soil. I have friends who say that sounds like a, a you know, a biker, a biker group. Uh, but sons of the soil. Sons of the soil are groups in a country that had once been dominant but have either recently lost power or are in decline. And so um, the Serbs are a perfect example of that. Serbs had dominated both the government positions, the civil service positions, and military positions in the former Yugoslavia. Once it started to break out, Slovenia left, Croatia left, Bosnia, Bosnia was, was seeking to leave. That meant that what the Serbs were gonna be left with was gonna be much smaller. The same is true in Iraq. Iraq had a, a big civil war, which is still in some respects going on today after the US went in in 2003 to topple Saddam Hussein. Um, what, what the US did in our quest to try to rapidly democratize Iraq is we kicked out Saddam Hussein, but we also kicked out all the Ba'ath Party members who were um, predominantly Sunni. And we instituted laws to say that they could not be rehired again in any civil service capacity, they could not serve in government, and if they had been part of the military, they could not be recruited back into the military. So this meant there were hundreds of thousands of Sunnis who had lost all power, um, and they went from a position of privilege to a, a, a pos position of being second-class citizens, and they're the ones um, who organized. It helps if they're also geographically concentrated. Um, it helps if, there's, if, if they are what we call a super faction, where a group is not only ethnically the same, but they have, um, they're also religiously similar to each other, and if they tend to be predominantly located in rural areas. Um, those are the groups that have an easier time organizing, um, and, and those are the groups that we tend to see um, starting these wars. You, you talk in your book about um, leaderless resistance, um, militias, phantom yeah. cells. Yeah. Can you give us some context on transitioning from that directly into how, how these new yeah. kind of civil war groups actually organize? Yeah, I do think like one of the reasons why people have a hard time um, thinking that America could have another civil war is, like Stuart said earlier, they have this notion that it's going to look like the war we had in the 1860s, where you have two large armies meeting each other on a battlefield. They're wearing uniforms. It's very hierarchically structured. That is not the way war, civil wars in the 21st century are fought, and especially not 
against um, really strong militaries like you have here in the United States. Just to give you a sense, uh, like a, a, a data point of, of what has changed, at the turn of the 20th century, 90% of fatalities, 90% of, of deaths in civil wars were soldiers. So it was the soldiers who were fighting each other. Today, 90% of deaths in civil wars are civilians. So it's radically shifted where wars now are fought by um, multiple different factions, militias, paramilitary groups. Sometimes they work with each other, sometimes they don't. It's like, it's like militarized cells spread around throughout a country. And their goal is to avoid government forces. If, if, if insurgent groups here in the United States ever engaged the US military directly, they'd be slaughtered. Um, and so what they do is they instead, they target infrastructure. Um, they use um, uh, unconventional tactics like terrorism, guerrilla warfare. Um, they'll put a bomb in an Ikea, or they'll try to um, destroy an electric grid. Um, they'll try to assassinate opposition leaders. So these are the types of insurgencies that you tend to see. Think about um, the IRA against um, the United Kingdom, or Hamas against Israel. It's more like that than what we saw um, 100 plus years ago. And what, what's the role of, I, mean, I think that when we think about um, these insurgency groups and militias, um, we're not thinking about necessarily economic elites. Um, what's the role of economic elites in, in these countries where, where things do go wrong? How, what role are they playing? So economic elites can be really important and it's, it's an area that most, most people don't know about. Um, and, and they're important for two reasons. Civil wars are incredibly costly. They're costly in terms of loss of lives, but in, it, they're also costly in terms of um, economic decline, not only during the war, but, but countries that experience civil wars tend to experience economic decline even after the war ends. They, they also tend to um, experience multiple civil wars, so it creates what we call a conflict trap. Um, and then they're really, they're political costs. Countries that experience civil wars, um, uh, their governments tend to get weaker and more unstable as a result. So um, business elites can be really important because um, they're going to pay some of the costs of war and therefore they have incentives to try to prevent it. And I'll give you an example to help bring this to life. Um, back in the 1980s, the mid-1980s, people would ask me, you know, where do you think a, a civil war is most likely around the world? And I thought for sure it was going to be South Africa. In fact, everybody who studied civil war said, South Africa is, is going to explode. And, um, and that's because you had a minority regime, you had an apartheid regime um, <clears throat> that was facing an increasingly angry and mobilized majority population. And in the face of that, rather than reforming, um, they doubled down and they began to um, become more and more violent. So if you guys remember the Soweto riots um, and the Soweto um, massacre, when, when government forces went into one of the black townships um, in Johannesburg um, while school children were peacefully protesting and they just mowed mowed them down and they mowed them down on television. They were so secure in their power that they didn't care if the world saw them killing children. And so those of us who are watching this thought, well, there's no way this is gonna end in compromise. Um, the, the black majority is gonna be forced, forced to turn to violence. And then it all changed. Both the uh, left power, he was a tried and true uh, white supremacist. De Klerk came in in his place. He'd been a member of both his parties, so there's, it's not like he had a coming to Jesus moment, but he came to power um, and um, he, he basically very quickly agreed to transfer majority control to the black population. He released Nelson Mandela from prison and, and within a very short period of time signed a peace agreement and South Africa radically changed. 
So the question is, okay, why did the apartheid regime do this? Why did they suddenly change their tune? And again, it wasn't because they suddenly got a conscience. It's because the white business community finally said, we're not going to support you anymore. And why did the white business community suddenly withdraw its support? It's because economic sanctions were hurting them. And it, it was hurting the business community enough that they had to make a choice. They could either have profits or they could have continued apartheid, but they could not have both. And when the decision became that stark, they chose profits they told the apartheid regime that they were not going to support it anymore. And once the apartheid regime lost the support of the business community, they realized that they could not survive. And you had reform, and war was avoided. So that's a case where, in the absence, people like to say it was de Klerk and Mandela. And, and they did absolutely play a role. Mandela especially, he could have been vindictive. He could have exacted revenge. He could have been an angry, you know, ethnic entrepreneur and, and mobilized blacks to, to go after the white population. And he didn't do that. But really, the story that people aren't telling about South Africa is the role of the white business community and their role in incentivizing the white politicians to, to enact the reforms that they otherwise wouldn't have done. So I, I want to come back to South Africa yeah. and the, the business community um, at the end. Um, you've given us a, a, a great picture of kind of how this happens yeah. and where things go wrong and one place where it went right. As you look at the United States today and you apply the analysis, where are we? Uh, so at the end of 2020, um, if the CIA had been allowed to study the United States, we would have put the United States on something we called the watch list. The watch list was where countries went when they had both, when they were both an anocracy and they had the second feature of ethnic, racial, political parties. Um, we would put countries on a watch list. This watch list, I believe, went to went to the White House and to DOD. I don't know what they what they did with the list, um, um, but we would have put the United States on the watch list. We were in this middle zone at the end of 2020. And another thing that most people don't know is that the Republican Party, to us, is a classic ethnic faction. Um, in 2008, white Americans were almost equally divided between the Democratic and the Republican Party. <laughs> um, these were not racial parties. But once, when Obama was elected, the white working class began to gravitate towards the Republican Party, which for political scientists like me is odd because their economic interests do not lie with the Republican Party. Economically and in terms of social services, the white working class tends to do better under Democrats than under Republicans. But they started to gravitate towards the Republican Party, which had also increasingly been catering to evangelical Christians. So today, the, the Republican Party is 90% white, predominantly evangelical Christian, in a country that is multi-ethnic and multi-religious. Again, if the CIA had been, a, had been allowed to look at the United States, we would classify the Republican Party as an ethnic faction that the US politics is ethnically factionalized and we would have been put on the watch list. Today, we are no longer in this middle zone. Once we had this peaceful transfer of power, we were upgraded to a positive eight. But again, this could easily slip back um, into, the, into the middle zone. Can, can, you, can you spend a minute talking about the role of what you call accelerationists oh. in, in this? Oh, the, okay. So, um, <clears throat> What often happens in the precursor to, to civil war is that most people don't want civil war, but there's every society has people who are on the radical fringe, um, and they're more passionate about something, or they're willing to use um, violence to get their goals, and usually they remain the fringe. When they grow, 
when they get the support of more moderate citizens, <clears throat> it's often because moderate citizens lose hope. They lose hope that the system is going to serve them. And the two ways that groups think sons of the soil tend to lose hope is through elections. If they have a, con a series of consecutive elections that they cannot win, that reveals to them that they don't have the votes to compete in that system. And if you don't have the votes to compete in that system, it doesn't work for you anymore. And, and what happens often then is elements of, of the mainstream begin to gravitate towards the extreme and, and the extreme measures that they're willing to pursue. There are groups in the United States that adhere to a philosophy called accelerationism. And accelerationism is the idea that the system is so broken, or the system is so rigged, or the system is, is so, um, unhelpful is too kind a word, but, but so rigged against a particular group that they have to accelerate civil war. And, and that is exactly, the, they want to destroy the system using violence as a means to rebuild a different system that would better work for them. And that could be a Michigan militia member or a Silicon Valley billionaire. Yes, yes. Fair. Um, okay, so uh, fast forwarding to 2024, um, let's presume that there are, there are two outcomes at the highest level. Yeah. Um, a, a, a Democrat is elected and, um, or a, a Republican, presumably Donald Trump, is elected. Yeah. How, how do you play that out as you look at the history that, that you've studied and written about? You mean what, what's going to happen? Yeah. What, what, are, what, are the, what are the risks and the opportunities? And I'm, I'm avoiding scenarios where, yeah. you know, a, a Democrat seems lawfully elected, but the House refuses to seat that. Like, just clean two scenarios. H how, do you, how do you see that playing out? So let me start with the risks. Um, and, and then I'll talk about, you know, what I, what I worry about in 2024. So we know on the task force that countries that have these two features, which the US had at the end of 2020 and could easily have again, puts countries at, a, at about a 4% annual risk of civil war. That seems really small, but it's not. What it means is that every year that you don't reform, every year that a country continues to have those two features, um, you increase the risk of war so that after 30 years, the, the risk would be over 100%. It's, it's, very, it's exactly the same as the risks for smoking. If I started to smoke today, my risk of dying of, of lung cancer or a, a smoking-related disease this year would be very small. If I continued to smoke for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, my risk would eventually be quite high. And it's the same with these two risk factors. Um, so that, I mean, in some ways, that is hopeful. We know the warning signs of civil war. Most people don't. Um, the people who, who were in Sarajevo, um, you know, in the, in the early 1990s, um, they got stuck there. They didn't think a civil war was going to happen, and, and suddenly um, it, it erupted, and, and, and they were surprised. We know the risk factors. If we know them, we can do something about it. It really depends on whether we have the political will to do that. 2024, I worry no matter who gets elected. If a Democrat wins, um, most Republicans, and, I, and that is a majority of, of Republican voters, will believe that the election was stolen. They still believe that the 2020 election was stolen. And if they lose again, they'll double down on, well, their leadership will double down on that lie. And, and you know, average Republicans will continue to believe in it. That is a loss of hope. If they keep losing elections, um, you know, they're, they, they're going to conclude that this system either is illegitimate um, or it's certainly not serving their needs. And, and if you can't work within the system, then the only way to change it is to work outside the system. And there's a whole group of, of far right militias um, who are pushing, pushing for violence as, as the best means to change the system. If a Republican wins, um, 
what I worry about is, is that they understand that they, if, if you continue to be a party of white evangelical Christians, you do, white, whites in the United States are declining demographically faster than any, any other group, or they're growing slower than any other group. They know they don't have the votes to compete in a democracy that's one person, one vote. And so they understand that, the, that their only option right now, their only peaceful option, is to undercut democracy and create a system that cements in minority rule. And so I worry if a Republican is in power and they have a majority in, in the House and the Senate, which they might have, then they can continue to strengthen the executive branch at the expense of the legislative branch. They can continue to stack the Supreme Court, and they can take a whole series of measures in terms of, of voting um, and in terms of, of resisting any sort of reforms that will, that will change I don't want to see change that will that will create, um, you know, at best an anocracy and, and potentially even worse. So we, we've got about a minute left. Yeah. And um, you've got a room full of business leaders yeah. here. And um, you're, you're Paul Revere. Um, you know, the, 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 it may be coming. What, yeah. what can everyone here do literally starting this afternoon to start mitigating yeah. that risk? So one of, the, one of the unique aspects of America's democracy, um, and there are many unique aspects of American democracy, is the role of, of, of the importance of business in our country and the role of money in, in our elections. Um, and that puts power in the hands of business leaders, right? If we were Canada or if we were the UK, there would be less that business leaders can, could do. Here in the United States, we, you know, we could have a list that lists um, all of our, our, our Congress men and women and all of our senators um, who are supporting undemocratic measures. We, we, can, we can be very transparent about who's supporting democracy and who is actively taking measures to dismantle it. And business leaders can shift funds away from those individuals to those who are trying to shore up our democracy, trying to reform our democracy. And at this point, when, when many of our um, legislators are in safe districts, right? They don't have to respond to voters, but they do care about campaign financing, and campaign financing comes from you guys, um, and, and that will gain their attention. Amazing. We're out of time. Thank you so much, Robert. Appreciate Thank it. You, Thank you, everyone.